English 219, the final home stretch here. Six days of the course left, uh, which probably freaks some of you out. Some of you are probably rejoicing, and some of you are probably somewhat in the middle. But uh, we're all going to get there just the same. And so I uh, just want to make a quick video to talk to you a little bit about your proposals. I realize that the last two assignments of this semester are the least cut and dried, so to speak. They kind of have the most moving parts. They require the most uh, sort of innovative thinking. Uh, and, and for a lot of reasons, they can be the most difficult, particularly in an on online class. But I want to just tell you a couple of things. First and foremost, your web writing assignments were, for the most part, very good. Um, in fact, the best batch that I've received, uh, folks seem to really have fun with that. Uh, to be able to reimagine the web presence of a small business seemed to strike a chord with many of you. And you demonstrated a real ability to not only uh, produce attractive looking uh, documents or websites, but also ones that are really derived from a user's needs. And that's really the most important thing. Uh, if we talk about that triangle again, that's really where the user's needs and the business's goals sort of meet. That's what your website ought to be. It can't be too focused on either one. It really has to sort of be in that sweet spot. So we're going to put that assignment behind us. I'll have those graded here in the next day or so. Uh, and now we're going to move into our proposal assignment. And I've uh, received the, your problem statements for that. And uh, I, I can tell you uh, that when you're writing a proposal, whether it's a formal grant proposal or an internal proposal, or you're proposing something for a client or a customer, um, the ability to articulate the problem is really the most important part. And some of you still need to work on that. Um, in particular, you need to be able to uh, sort of remind yourself that in a grant situation such as this, it's a competitive situation. Same thing with a, with a, with a proposal where you're trying to sell somebody something. It's, it's a competitive situation where people have multiple options or are trying to solve um, or pick from multiple problems which one they'd like to solve. And so it's incumbent upon you to express why this is the best option or why this problem needs to be solved. And so some of you, uh, I think, thought that was sort of self-evident uh, about your problem. Like, this is a bad problem. Like, our students can't afford textbooks. It's a bad problem. Okay, that's fine. Um, but why, amongst other problems, is that one the, the one that's most in need of, of, a, of a solution. And so I would encourage you uh, to revisit your um, proposals and ask yourself, if somebody had an array of problems in front of them, would they be compelled to take action on this one? Would they see the immediacy of this problem? Would they understand the scope of this problem and how many people it affects? Would they understand the consequences of this problem? So for instance, a few of you wrote about textbooks, okay? Textbooks are super expensive. I think anybody with a brain probably knows that. Um, so. That's fine, and if you just leave it at that, you're probably not going to get a second look. But if you start to articulate um, the nuances of that problem, um, how many people are affected, virtually every student, some, some programs more than others. If you start to articulate the, the scale of the problem, just how much books cost, I think sometimes even if you just quantify something and you share with somebody something based on evidence, um, they're more likely to take you seriously. So if you can say, for instance, the average student achieving an associate's degree spends $3,200 a year on their textbooks, well, that's enough to compel me to take a look at that. Um, because I'm going to start to square that away against uh, the cost of tuition. I'm going to say, geez, that's really disproportionate. That doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and so you really want to start to do that. You really want to try to provide as much evidence as you can to the nature, the scope, the consequences, and the immediacy of your problem. And then you also want to be able to attach that problem to things that your audience cares about. And so we, I talked about that in my last video, but I'm going to reiterate here. You're writing to an audience of, of faculty members and administrators at the college. And they see the world in a very particular way. They're not students, so they don't see the world in the same way as students. Um, and so they're going to be more concerned with different things. In particular, they're going to be concerned with student success. So many of you did a nice job of articulating, for instance, textbooks are expensive. Gotcha. You showed me how expensive they are. You showed me how many people they affect. That's great. But what you didn't show me is why that matters in the grand scheme of things. Because if I'm reading this, I'm going to go, well, textbooks cost the same at every college in America. Why do I care about this? But there's evidence out there that shows us that the cost of textbooks does affect student success. It affects students' ability to retain, so to stay at school. It affects their ability to do well in school, so it affects their GPA. But you're not going to just be able to make this up. You're going to have to go out and do some research about the connection between those two things. And that's why I kind of integrated this assignment into the semester, is that it's the first assignment that we really have that's going to require you to do in-depth research and to present that research. And so um, I'd encourage many of you to continue poking around out there. And so. Many of you are starting to sort of finish up that problem statement and you'll move into your solution. And uh, the solution statement is just where you clearly articulate um, how you're going to solve that problem and why you're so sure that your solution will solve that problem, right? So um, 
it's really important for you to show the feasibility of that solution, so why you think it's likely to work. Um, and so you could point to existing programs at the college that you could sort of latch on to, existing resources at the college that you could use. Sometimes that's helpful. So some of you are talking, for instance, about child care. You know, one of, the, one of the gold standards in sort of proposal writing or grant writing is you want to prove that this is doable, feasible, that it's easy, that it's not going to be that difficult, that you're not reinventing the wheel, etc. So if you're talking about child care, some of you were smart enough to go, geez, we have an early childhood education program at the school. Why don't we try to latch onto that? So um, you really want to show the feasibility. Uh, you want to show the efficacy, so how well something like this works. So that's particularly important if you can point to, for instance, one, 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 uh, one of the proposals uh, addressed uh, textbooks and said, look, you can use open education resources. And that person was smart enough to go out and find a resource that studied the effectiveness of open education resources. And so now they can point to evidence and say, at this small rural community college in Iowa, they switched from proprietary textbooks to open education resources, and they found no discernible difference in student satisfaction with the courses and the materials, and actually they find, found higher GPAs because students were actually able to do the readings because they had the books. Okay, that's compelling because now I can see, oh my God, there is a track record of this particular um, solution working. And so that's your, that's your sort of goal and the solution is to not only prove that it would solve the problem, but that it would solve the problem in the best possible way. And so that's where you're looking at cost effectiveness, efficiency, um, efficacy, those types of things. And so again, you can make as many claims as you want. You can say, oh, it'll be cheap. Well, show me how cheap. You can say, well, it works. Well, show me how it works. Again, anytime we're writing in a persuasive sort of mode, we're trying to leverage good evidence to support claims. And so, you know, one of the things that you could do is go through your proposal and you could look and for every claim you make, you should have some evidence. Now, sometimes that evidence might be anecdotal. So you might be telling me a story about something that you've observed or something that you've experienced. Um, it could be hypothetical. So I actually encourage one student in the class to use the hypothetical to illustrate the, what, what could happen or what would happen if something took place or didn't take place. So again, your job is, is, is to just be as compelling and as specific and as precise as possible. When you're speaking in abstractions and generalizations, your credibility goes out the window. But when you can point to uh, tangible evidence you're really cooking with gas. And that's when you're gonna move the needle with the reader. And that's when they're gonna be able to see and understand uh, the magnitude of the problem that you're trying to solve. And that's when they're gonna really come on board and understand that the solution that you're pitching to them is optimal in some way. Uh, that it's most likely to work, that it's the most cost effective, etc. And so that's really what this proposal assignment is about. I don't want you to get freaked out about it. As long as you're clearly articulating a problem and you're articulating a solution and showing me the correspondence between the solution and the problem and the likelihood that that solution will work, um, you're going to be in, in, a, in a good position. I, I don't care about how long it is. I don't care about how many sources you use. Um, what I do care about is that you're drawing those lines of correspondence so that somebody, because realistically that's, that's what a proposal, a good proposal is going to do in the workplace. And we've talked about this, I talked about this in the last video, um, but if you were trying to pitch for a new excavator or a new piece of equipment, you would simply have to prove that there is a problem in the current situation, that you're leaving money on the table, that it's taking too much time, that there's too much risk, whatever it is. Whatever, however you want to articulate that problem to a given audience. And then you just have to show me that the, the solution that you're pitching makes sense to solve that problem. And, that, and that's really what I want you to get out of this. Um, so uh, let me know what you have for particular problems. We have some people that are sort of all over the map right now, and that's pretty common here in week eight. Uh, things tend to happen during the summer. Um, so let me know what your individual needs are. If you need individual feedback, I'm happy to do that. Um, if you want to uh, go over something with me, pitch an idea to me, whatever it takes, uh, you can email me, text me, call me. Uh, but that's really what we're up against with this proposal assignment. So uh, keep that in mind, uh, that it's really about the quality. Of it. It's hard to write a good proposal if you don't have quality information. That's, that's the moral of the story. And so if I created a pie chart of how you should be devoting your time for this uh, proposal writing exercise, a big slice of that pie would probably be research. Um, because you're probably not uh, not going to be able to write a good um, proposal without that good quality information. And some of you had it. Some of you, every paragraph was just, you know, dense, sometimes too dense. In fact, I made this comment, too dense with information, but you were really able to articulate, for instance, how poor our students are and how that affects their academic success uh, relative to food insecurity, for instance. I mean, every sentence wasn't a generalization, wasn't an abstraction, it was a precise measurement, it was a pre precise piece of evidence so that I, as the reader, could really understand the magnitude of what you were saying. So that's what we're up against. Let me know if you need anything.